We've all heard that opposites attract. <laughs> and in the world of literature, I cannot think of two greater opposites than Lewis Carroll and Sherlock Holmes. Now, although both of them were masters in logic, Lewis Carroll was most famous for his humorous works, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and his sequel, Alice to the Looking Glass. Sherlock Holmes, meanwhile, was known for his uncanny skills in observation, perception, logic, and deduction. It is said, if a single pine needle falls in the forest, the wolf smells it, the deer hears it, and the eagle sees it. A proper postscript to that saying would be Sherlock Holmes, based on his finely tuned observational skills, would know precisely where it fell, which tree it came from, what type of tree it was, how long it took to reach the ground, when it landed, and what direction it was pointing in when it got there. <laughs> Lewis Carroll, however, would write a poem about the pine needle involving the brothers Tweedle, their names dumb and deep, would be brillig as could be. A call for heads would be seen, courtesy of the Red Queen. <laughs> so is it the attraction of opposites that bring Lewis, and Lewis Carroll and Sherlock Holmes together? They do find themselves in the same stories on more than one occasion, and that is what I'm presenting on today, Sherlock Holmes-Lewis Carroll crossovers. Indeed, it was the imagining of how the most logical of detectives would respond to the most illogical literary characters, the Cheshire Cat, that inspired me to write Sherlock Holmes and the Adventure of the Grinning Cat in 2015. We'll go into that in greater detail shortly, but first, let us look at an overview of the subject. I have found eight works written that fall in the category of Alice in Wonderland and Sherlock Holmes crossovers. In Pursuit of Lewis Carroll from 1994, Sherlock Holmes and the Alice in Wonderland Murders from, uh, from 2000, Sherlock Holmes, The Adventure of the Deadly Illusion from 2013, and of course, Sherlock Holmes and the Adventure of the Grinning Cat in 2015. There are three short stories, Case of the Detective Smile and Elementary, My Dear Watson, from 1995, and The Case of the Unmarked Graves, written in 2001. And there was also a one-act play, Sherlock Holmes in Wonderland, from 2013. We'll first look at the short stories, then the play, and finally the novels in the order they were produced, published. The Case of the Detective Smile and Elementary, My Dear Watson, were published in 1995 as part of a collection of Sherlock Holmes short stories entitled Sherlock Holmes in Orbit. While both authors show an excellent understanding of Lewis Carroll's characters and provide many allusions and references to Alice's Wonderland, I feel that only one of them has a true appreciation of Lewis Carroll. Elementary, My Dear Watson by Lauren Schimmel is a very brief story in which Lewis Carroll is portrayed as a villain and he is mysteriously vanished. Sherlock Holmes is called in to investigate, and he determines that several Wonderland characters who were summoned by Alice, who was actually Carol's niece, provided a sample of the eat me cake, which caused Carol to shrink in size until he was small enough to be devoured by Alice's cat. Holmes casually comments that it can be said, the missing person died of consumption. <laughs> While many clever references to Alice in Wonderland are present, the story casts Charles Dodson in a very negative light and was really not and at all enjoyable to me. Case of the Detective Smile, however, by Mark Bourne, was most delightful and leaves the reader with a warm glow of satisfaction in having read the story. It begins with a lady dressed in morning attire showing up at 221B Baker Street and presenting a calling card, a very rare and unusual queen of hearts from an unusual deck of cards. Sherlock, of course, is able to immediately deduce its origin and determine a great deal about its owner, but he still asks, why is she there? She has come to present Sherlock Holmes with a token of her appreciation for his solving a case that involved missing tarts. The lady's name, of course, is Alice. And she explains that as Watson has chronicled Holmes' various cases and adventures, it was Charles Dodson that recorded Alice's adventures in Wonderland, which in truth were quite real. He wrote them under a pen name, of course, which should be familiar to everyone here. Holmes recalls with fondness of how a curious case that he solved for her, which literally saved her head, and he is presented with a glass case containing a glowing smile from the Cheshire cat. Not to worry, though, for the cat has many and uses each one only once. Watson then comments how since that day, whenever dark clouds settled over the great detective, Sherlock Holmes would open the glass box and smile. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, the short story, The Case of the Unmarked Graves, is part of the book, Conned Again, Watson, Cautionary Tales of Logic, Math, and Probability by Colin Drews. The author uses the characters of Holmes and Watson to share entertaining stories of how relying on common sense and ignoring mathematics 
can often get one into trouble. Sherlock uses his unequal powers of logic, deduction, probability, statistics, and decision theory to solve crimes while investigating, while also disproving common gambling fallacies and over-reliance on statistics. The book is obviously meant to be one that makes logic more fun and interesting, but in the short story of specific interest to us, which features Dr. Watson interacting with Charles Dodson, the author places the date as 1900, which is actually two years after Lewis Carroll had passed away. Not logical. Carroll is also described as short when he was, in fact, tall and slender. Once we get past these very illogical errors, we have a tale in which Dodson repeatedly uses game of chance logic to help Watson serve the mystery of ancient unmarked graves while helping Sherlock Holmes solve the mystery of a moneylender. The aforementioned graves are located on private land whose owner has absolute rule, and he refuses to let any work proceed unless it can be unequivocally be proven that the results will succeed. Throughout the story, Dotson demonstrates the simplicity of how basic logic will refute obvious percentages every time. The one-act play, Sherlock Holmes in Wonderland by Jeff Moyer, is a fast-paced farcical romp that starts out with Holmes and Watson being kidnapped and taken to Wonderland. They are brought there to determine who is the thief in a series of iconic Wonder Lab items that have mysteriously vanished. Of course, they are not told exactly what has been stolen or who the victims are, and he has less than two hours to solve the case, or it's off with their heads. What we need not worry, though, is Holmes cleverly determines the victims, the missing items, who has taken them, and exactly how it was done. It turns out it was Alice disguised as one of the playing card guards who was actually only borrowing the rabbit's watch, the hatter's hat, the caterpillar's hookah, and the Cheshire smile to take back to London so she can prove that her stories about Wonderland were real and that she really, truly, honestly is not insane. The items are safely returned, and Dr. Watson will vouch for her, so she need not worry. And all ends well. Humorous banter between Holmes and Watson, and many puns abound in this enjoyable journey into Wonderland, courtesy of the great detective. <coughs> Turning to the novels, as I previously stated, there are four. In Pursuit of Lewis Carroll by Raphael Scheberman is an in-depth look at Charles Dodson through the logical eyes of Lewis Carroll or, or, excuse me, through the eyes and intellect of Sherlock Holmes, or at least one who claims to be him. The author, who is somewhat perplexed over the curiosities regarding Charles Darwin, Charles Dodson's dualistic personality, is returning from a concert, and he happens to walk past a home very near Baker Street with the name S. Holmes on the mailbox. On a chance, he rings the bell and is invited in to only to discover a living embodiment of Sherlock Holmes in a very 19th century parlor setting with the exception, of course, of a computer sitting on the desk. And the great detective, of course, is able to deduce the fact that the author has recently returned from a library and is timing in his research on Charles Dodson. Thus begins their investigation, which occurs over the course of several weekly Sunday afternoon meetings. Invoking information that the author states has previously been overlooked prior to its publication, and a newly discovered poem that the author says is almost certainly by Carroll, the book covers the complex and dual personalities of Car Lewis Carroll and Charles Dodson as well as examining Carroll's relationship with his mother, his father, his numerous child friends, and the formidable Mrs. Little. And readers may be surprised to learn of Carroll's in keen interest in determining the identity of Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Over the course of the afternoon discussions, many interesting thoughts are brought forth, from the influences of George MacDonald and David Lindsay's work to the dreamlike quality of Dodson's life. Holmes points out that in Dodson's poem Solitude, published in The Train magazine, the accompanying illustration is, in fact, the dreamer on the hill from Lindsay's novel, A Voyage to Arcturus. Published in 1920, A Voyage to Arcturus combined fantasy, philosophy, science fiction, and another worldly explanation of the nature of good and evil and their relationship with existence. The drawing portrays Charles Lewis Carroll contemplating the world of solitude he had created. The author returns the next Sunday expecting to continue their discussion, only to find out that the name on the mailbox had changed and is no longer S. Holmes. The great detective had vanished. Bewildered and confused, the author returns home, returns home, gathers his notes, and begins to write his book in pursuit of, of Lewis Carroll. It concludes with a republication of S.D. Collingwood's comprehensive bibliography of Carroll's works. In Sherlock Holmes and the Alice in Wonderland Murders, written by Barry Day, Holmes crosses paths with John Moxton, an American whose new London Daily paper is threatening and undermining political stability in England, while at the same time public figures are first being humiliated and then murdered 
with each incident having a strange direct parallel to events from Alice in Wonderland. With each incident, England drifts closer to chaos and anarchy, and Moxton's newspaper is always there to cover the event. Only Sherlock Holmes is able to unravel what is actually going on in a Lewis Carroll-influenced grand game of chess between the great detective and Moxton, who turns out to be Moriarty returned. Although the story begins with Moxton using sonar to search for the Loch Ness Monster, which are both completely out of context in historical correctness for the date of the story, references to Lewis Carroll abound and are creatively interwoven throughout the story, and it cleverly ends with Dr. Watson intending to stop the racetrack to place a bet on a horse named Snark. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, the, deadly, the Adventure of the Deadly Illusion by Ron Bracken was released in 2013 and it presents a scenario set in 1872 where Charles Dodson is the don of Sherlock Holmes when he was attending Christ Church, Oxford. While Dodson is generally unpopular with his student, undergraduate students due to his peculiar and fastidious ways, Sherlock and Charles got along well to the, due to their shared interest in crime, theater, science, and logic. In particular, they both enjoyed the magic shows at the Egyptian Hall Theater. Dodson delighted in the magic and the wonder of the illusion losing himself completely in them, while Sherlock Holmes easily figured out the secret behind the trick, and they often shared an afternoon cup of tea to discuss details of the illusions. A series of jewel thefts, all involving members of the Reform Club, of which Dotson is a member, turns deadly when a butler is killed during the latest break-in. Now, Scotland Yard, of course, feels that it was a very simple case. The butler surprised the thief, and he was murdered. Simple. But Sherlock Holmes and Dotson after examining the scene of the crime, feel otherwise. With assistance of a famous stage magician, they plan an elaborate ruse to expose the real criminal, who turns out to be none other than, once again, Moriarty. The reader gets a look at Charles Dodson, early life at Oxford, through the eyes of Sherlock Holmes, and it is an interesting and enjoyable story. Sherlock Holmes and the Adventure of the Grinning Cat is the first book in the Sherlock Holmes and the Missing Authors trilogy which is a series of standalone stories that all share the theme of Holmes going in search of famous authors, and it is the author's fictional literary characters come to life who are seeking Sherlock's help. The story begins with Holmes and Watson waking up to find a cat sitting in their study. Sherlock wonderingly comments, Hello, what is this? What are you doing here? And how did you even get in here? Much to their surprise, the cat grins and answers that it is there to engage Sherlock's services, and it came through the door. Holmes immediately suspects Watson of ventriloquism, but the cat replies, Watson could not throw his voice even if he had a catapult. <laughs> Cheshire then walks through the door and literally through a solid wooden door, becoming intangible as he does so. After reappearing in the room, he crosses the room and rubs against Sherlock hair, depositing a good deal of cat hair as he does. Sherlock, then being an expert on all things related to cat hair, having written a monograph on the subject, Determining human disposition to violent behavior based on the nature and quantity of cat hair on clothing, examines the cat hair and sits down in the chair across from the cat and begins staring back at it. After several hours of staring at each other, Holmes concludes that against all logic and reason and probability, the Cheshire cat is indeed there and it is real. So he asks how could he possibly be of help to it. The cat replies that some tea would be nice and someone should answer the door, at which point a loud thumping then is then heard. The Mad Hatter and the White Rabbit proceed to join the group for the first of several tea parties, parties that are integral to the story. Holmes, of course, is completely unfazed and inquires if Lewis Carroll knows they are there. They resoundingly answer that that is the second part of the problem. They cannot find Lewis Carroll. And Alice is missing too from Wonderland. In fact, the March Hare is gone and parts of Wonderland itself are beginning to disappear. Sherlock concludes that the only logical choice is to visit Lewis Carroll's home and determine what exactly is going on. Curiously enough, their carriage ride to Dodson home is both interrupted and facilitated by the Jabberwocky as well as a unicorn. So begins a madcap tale that takes Sherlock Holmes and Watson to the homes of Charles Dodson and H.G. Wells on a side trip to Mars via Wells' time machine, to Alice's Wonderland where Holmes must defeat the Red Queen in a game of imaginary croquet so they can return to London. And finally, they step outside of time itself to solve the ultimate logic puzzle upon which the outcome of the entire adventure rests. Along the way, we discovered it was a white rabbit that inspired H.G. Wells to write War of the Worlds. 
And we learned that a logic puzzle wager between Lewis Carroll and the Guardians of Time brought Wonderland, all of its inhabitants, to life. However, unless the puzzle is correctly solved, Wonderland, its characters, and Sherlock Holmes as well, will disappear forever. Fortunately, the master of logic, Sherlock Holmes, is there to bring the story to a successful conclusion. And humor, puns, and Wonderland wordplay abound in this literary colli collision between logic and nonsense. Now, on a final footnote, the book ends with Captain Nemo of the Nautilus appearing at Baker Strait to seek Holmes' help in finding Jules Verne, who's vanished. <laughs> so in conclusion, we have examined four novels, three short stories, a play, and we have looked at the life of Charles Dodson and seen many creative references to Wonderland and his characters woven into the stories, as well as Holmes and Watson actually visiting Wonderland and interacting with Alice, the Cheshire Cat, the Hatter, and the rest. And each example we have looked at has grown curiouser and curiouser. And it all proves that in the case of Charles Dodson and Sherlock Holmes, opposites not only attract, they go together as perfectly as afternoon and tea. Thank you.